here's, here's, here's one. How many counties in Leinster? Uh, twelve. Okay, Joey. Joey's been doing this. Joey, make the question. But actually, yeah, she, she, the reason I'm saying it is this: is um, uh, the, all the counties in Ireland they have a name, and you know, they usually there's a reason why their name those things. Uh, usually, like their phonetic translations from Gaelic names that went before, you know, we were we were taken over. But the um, the Irish people have a way of uh, naming things in, in in an ordinary way. Like we have two national anthems in Ireland when we sing because they can't agree. <laughs> so if you watch the rugby game an Ireland are playing, you'll hear two national anthems because. <laughs> They don't know. But actually the real national anthem is probably the song the supporters sing, which is a song called The Fields of Latin Rye. It's a very sad song, but very, it touches the hearts of, you know, of people in this country. And so there's a, a way even with the counties in Ireland that um, they have kind of got pet names and adopted names. And Juliana comes from a county called that. Cork. Corky. And it means, uh, but the people call it that. The Rebel County. Yeah. The next county over is Kerry, but the people call it the Kingdom. And there's another county, Clare, but people call it the Banner. And Kenny's known as the Cats. And it goes on and on. Armagh's the Orchard County, Wicklow's the Garden of Ireland. I don't know all of them, but there's a, a kind of like a, a nickname or a pet name. And I grew up in a county, County Offaly, um, in, my, in, my, in my youth. And uh, for some reason that I don't know, because um, I used to follow her in football as well, we became known as the Faithful County. I have absolutely no, no, no idea why that is, but that's what the county became known as, the Faithful County. And during the prayer meeting during the week, um, Alice Power was there, so was someone who just encouraged the prophecy. I just felt the Lord give me one word prophetically for anyone who was there. Um, that I am faithful. And so I just thought about, well, what does that actually mean? Jesus said, I am faithful. And Tom and a few others brought scriptures that refer to Jesus being faithful. And one of his titles is Faithful and True. So if Jesus has a title, the faithful and true, it's important to actually know what this word is about. What, why is that his title? Why is that being emphasized in a title for Jesus? And this word faithful, just a little bit of a, a brief kind of word meaning. Um, in the Hebrew, it's pronounced all man. All man. And it means a number of different things. It can mean to build up or support. It can mean to foster as a parent or a nurse. It can mean to render firm or be firm. It can mean to trust or believe. It can mean to be permanent or quiet. It can mean to be true or certain. It can mean to go to the right hand. So you can see there's a number of different, depending on the context, a number of different uh, possibilities for using that word. But I like the Greek word because it's actually very straightforward and I think it says it all in one word. The word they use is pistis. Sounds like a piston of an engine. And if this word in the Greek means trustworthy. So if you're seeing Jesus, the faithful and true, Jesus is trustworthy and true. And this is um, really important really important with God. This is not something that you might think is kind of, you know, it's a nice quality to have, maybe I don't have it. This is actually a biggie when it comes to God. One of the big um, desirable characteristics that God wants to form in us, but it was certainly one of the characteristics of Jesus. You see, Jesus had, just like us, he had temptations, he had human flesh, he had desires, he had, you know, all sorts of things going on, but he proved himself faithful and true to God. He proved himself faithful and true. 
And sometimes in life we can say a lot of things, we can get to know the Bible well, especially if you've grown up around the Bible believing home or church, you can get to know lots of scriptures and so on. But being someone who's faithful and true, you know, we hear the saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Good and faithful, strong, trustworthy servant. And that's something we would all wish to hear when we meet the Lord. Wouldn't that be lovely if you heard the Lord say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. And I think that's something we should be mindful of in our service to God and in our life here on earth, that we're endeavouring to be worthy of that comment. And I don't, I don't believe you can necessarily presume that God would say that to you. You know, it would be very presumptuous just to say God would say that. Because God will weigh up everything and judge everything properly. But certainly, that should be something we sh should be aiming to live a Christian life in a way that God, we, we know that God can only speak the truth and say to you, well done, good and faithful service. Um, in the English dictionary, the word faithful can be defined as remaining true or loyal as in maybe marriage or you know, a relationship with a friend. Um, maintaining sexual loyalty to one's spouse. That's a really big one. Um, being consistently reliable. You know, the, 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 the people who depend on you, maybe your employer or friends or whatever, do they find that they can rely on? Um, and or it means being truthful. Um, some other words that could be possibly used instead of faithful are words like uh, constant, dependable, devoted, immovable, reliable, staunch, steadfast, true, truthful, unswerving and unwavering. But you get the picture. You're talking about somebody who is, I'm going to put it to you, very, very dependable. God's point of view. Though that word's not there, that, that's how I see it. Um, in the translations in the Bible of this word that became faithful, the King James and, and some other, there's a lot of different things, but there's sort of interplay with some words. Um, and what, some Bibles trans, uh, translate the word faithful as merciful or faithful love. Some translate as faithful love the word mercy. So they link mercy, the, the characteristic of God's mercy, to his faithfulness. Um, an interesting one is, translation for the word is, remained, someone remained faithful. It says they held unto the Lord. They cleaved to the Lord. The old concept was that if you were to be faithful to someone, you held on to them. You're not letting them go. You know, I'm staying with you. You know the way a kid might like, hold on to someone. I'm, I'm not letting go of you. I'm staying with you. Maybe someone is going away, you know, maybe to emigrate on the ship or go far away, and one of the children just holds on, I'm not letting you, I'm not going without, you know, I'm not letting you go without me. You know, just someone that's that bonded to somebody, that that is that absolutely like, um, you know, in love with that person, if you like, that they do not want to let go of that person. And that's um, a translation for um, cleave to the Lord, to hold on to it, to hold him on. But people often talk about the scriptures in like, oh, are we this or are we that? Does the scripture say this or that? The, 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 the thing that makes us different being in here is that we have a relationship with God. And our relationship with God often is very much dependent on how much we're actually hanging on to it. Rather than what we know about the Bible, how much we're actually hanging on to God. Remember, God used me very much in my younger years um, in healing, healing evangelism, but at that time, I remember most of my prayers were held by Jesus. I didn't really go beyond that, because I couldn't really get beyond that. I was just, especially when we were out far, and I was just kind of at my end most of the time. <laughs> That's all I could do, but you know, but God, you know, that dependability on God 
is something that God actually appreciates. It's something that God actually wants from us. Um, a faithful God is sometimes translated as a God of truth or concerning us. His faithful ones or his saints. Some Bibles translate the word saints as faithful ones. They're people who are um, loyal to God, basically, in the ways. It's a command of God to be, um, to be faithful. In Psalm uh, 119, verse 138, it says, Thy testimonies, it's a characteristic of God, if you like, Thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. Altogether trustworthy in some. Your testimonies that you have commanded are righteous and very faithful. When that word testimonies, you can interchange that with maybe commands or the laws of God. But they are righteous and very faithful. And that would mean very trustworthy. You can actually trust in God's commands. If you keep his commands, and the promises that are associated with keeping his commands are yours. You can trust him. If wisdom, if you, if you, if, if something in the Bible tells you this is a wise course of action, you can trust that if you take that course of action, according to what the scripture says, that it will both protect you and benefit you. It's something that can be trusted. The word of God can be trusted. And of God's own faithfulness, it says in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for His mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I think there's a song about that, you know, great is your faithfulness. You might have heard it so. It doesn't matter, you won't be able to get all of these because there's a lot in a minute. Um, in the Bible, we're told about faithful men. There are certain faithful men in the Bible. One is King Hezekiah, 2 Kings 18, verses 4 to 7. Um, he was the king who, who... No, it's okay. Sorry. Thanks. He's the king who reformed, brought in reforms in Israel, when Israel had gone deep into idolatry, adopted pagan customs around them, um, and really broken fellowship with God and he was one of the great reformed kings. And he says he removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars. He cut down the wooden image and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. From those days the children of Israel burned incest to it and called it Nehushtag. He made it a false god of the bronze snake. He, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor war before him. I jump ahead to the, uh, 7, 6. For he held fast the Lord, and did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him, he prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and did not serve him. But he's known as um, being a faithful man of God in the Bible. The next, there are numerous, but just some that I picked out. A guy called Hanani and Hananiah. Um, in Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 2. They were considered faithful men. But the, the interesting characteristic that they possessed is that they feared God the most of the people. They had the greatest fear of God among the people. And that's one quality that if you have... The fear of God, it says, is the beginning of wisdom. But you know, if you genuinely fear God, that keeps you in check. You just don't want to, you don't want to step out of line. Because you, you have the fear of God. And that's something, something that we're encouraged to possess. Moses was a man of God. And Numbers chapter 12, verse 7. And Hebrews 3, verse 5. Speak of him being the most faithful man there was. He was like... The most, not so with Moses, my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. He, God considered him to be so faithful that it says before that, that when God spoke to prophets, he used dreams and visions to relate him. But not so with Moses. He spoke to Moses face to face. There was no, no trying to interpret what God is saying to him. Because he was considered faithful. Abraham, Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 7 and 8. 
he was considered a faithful, a faithful man. His name would be Abraham and became Abraham. And he was considered faithful before God. And that was the time pre, pre Jesus coming into this world. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought, brought him up on the power of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham his exalted father. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanites. If God found his heart faithful before him, if God finds your heart faithful, be prepared to be blessed. If God finds your heart faithful before him, be prepared to be blessed. Because God, God weighs the thoughts and tents of our hearts. You know, God sees it all, make no mistake about it. But when God finds your heart faithful to Him, you, He really appreciates that. I mean, He really appreciates that. That is why He's looking for us. You know, that's why He can't invest in so many people, because they don't have a heart for Him. They don't even have a heart's desire for Him. That's why the world is, I guess, always trying to fix its own problems that we create all the time. Um, Daniel chapter 6 verse 4, the prophet Daniel is considered a faithful man. Now in the scripture, we are commanded to remain faithful to God. So on one hand, God would like us to do it voluntarily. But even if we don't, it's a command. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 20. Deuteronomy 11 22. You can put that one up if you want. Deuteronomy 11 22. Deuteronomy 13 verse 4. And Deuteronomy 30 verse 20. And this is the time, remember, around the time when God is given the law. For if you are, if you carefully keep all these commandments which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to hold fast to him, that word to hold fast to him is translated in some translations as to be faithful. In other words, you're holding fast to God. God is your dependent, you're depending on God, really. That's what it is. You're depending on him. You're not saying at home, I'm going to sort out this problem. I might want to you know, defend myself and I want to try. No, you're depending on God. You're depending on God. And this is something the world doesn't want to know. I met a guy in my evangelism last week, and uh, he was a foreign guy, and he said to me, he said, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in anything. He said, I believe in me, what I can do, what I can accomplish by my own power. And he said, and I said, he said, and I can succeed by myself. And I said, well, do you have a soul? Do you have a spirit? He said, no. I thought, well, I was wondering, are you a robot? Like, but but if this is such an attitude like that some people can have. Just an attitude like that, they can do it. I can do life without God. I can get on great without God. I can build a house without God. I don't need him. Of course, they're confusing the issue between your own power to do, you know, to, to negotiate life and your own need for a saviour from sin. Because they certainly can't do that. And so I tried to, you know, I tried to discuss it with him to maybe get him to think maybe another way about it. Um, one of the promises for a person who's faithful to God is protection. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 9. And you can get that one if you can at Psalm 31, verse 23. He will guard the feet of his saints. That word saints is translated in some translations as faithful ones. But the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man <coughs> prevails. So the guy last week who was telling me by his own power he was able to do all these things and accumulate wealth and do whatever he likes. But the scripture says for by strength no man prevails. Do you think, like, you know, sometimes I tease and Joy and Brenda in the house, like, I says, who's going to win if the fight breaks out here or whatever, you know. But, because that kind of makes you feel, you know, men are like that. But it's not by strength that you prevail, according to God's word. It's by your faithfulness to God that you prevail. Because God brings everything into judgment. Everything is brought into judgment before God. And so to succeed, see, see, it's saying the scriptures about a ruthless man, the only thing a ruthless man has is money. So you know, when a guy, I picked him up, or he picked me up actually, he wanted to meet someone in Torres, 
that I knew a homeless guy and who happened to be from the same area and said he'd like to see that guy. And I used to tell him in the car, we were driving down, and we were just sharing about God and my life and whatever. And he just turned around and he said to me, he said, Do you see what you've got there? And I said, well, he said, you've got everything. So I was kind of surprised to hear. And his friend told me um, when he went to the bathroom, we were in the hotel having dinner. And he said, you know that guy you're talking to? He said, I said, yeah. He said, you know how much that guy was worth? You know what I meant to talk. He said, well, he was worth 114 million. But he could turn around after having lost his marriage and he had opened a quarry out in Africa somewhere or something, but he'd been up there. He'd been in a high up there with money during the so-called Celtic Tiger. Because he realised he had nothing, really. You know, he'd find beautiful daughters, he'd show his picture. But when he could turn around and say, you've got everything, you know, for someone who had scaled the heights of what so-called success is, you realise it's not by strength that you prevail. In Psalm 4, verse 3, it says, Know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord will hear will I call to him. This translation is, has set apart the godly, and other translations has set apart the saints for himself. But he has set apart the faithful for himself. The interesting thing about being a Christian, because Jesus said to his followers, you didn't choose me. It's a very interesting thing because he called them. He said, no, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you to bear fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. You see, we respond to God, but it's God takes the initiative for us. No man can come to the Father except through Jesus, and no one can come to Jesus unless the Father trusts them. So we just thank God from our hearts. We just thank God that he, he would draw us. Otherwise, where would we be? Even if it, it was... Our spiritual birth might have been difficult. Um, in Psalm 101, verse 6, and in Revelation 17, verse 14, it says, when Jesus, in Revelation 17, verse 14, talks about Jesus coming back to the earth, and guess who's with him? The chosen faith. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen chosen by God I had someone say to me recently as a relative that you know I wasn't getting invited to that many of my relatives weddings and I just said to her well she said, God has chosen me that's enough for me I'd actually rather God choose me I'd like to be invited but I'd rather God choose me and be rejected by people and be accepted by people and rejected by God that's, you know, just kind of goes with the territory. Of course, Jesus is the great example. I mean, he gets the title faithful and true. You know, it's in, it's in Revelation all over the place. This was prophesied um, going way back. I don't have the reference for this scripture, but for you will not abandon me to Sheol or hell. You will not allow your faithful one, your holy one, to see decay, corruption. You reveal to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Sorry, I, I didn't write down the reference for that. But this prophecy came through David. You will not allow your faithful one, or other translations, your holy one, to see corruption. And of course Jesus was unique in his resurrection. Because those who have been resurrected before him, and even in this generation, there have been, you know, Counts of people being raised from the dead, they've all died again. But Jesus was raised incorruptible. He was raised in a glorified form. He was raised, you know, in the 40 days he was on earth, that's the body, his heavenly body. That's his holy body, it's an eternal body he has. And there's this strange relationship between heaven and the earth. We often think of heaven as, you know, when you're living there, you're like, like ghosts floating around or something. But Jesus ate food in his glorified body. No, he sat down and drank and talked in his glorified body. And so there's, um, there's an interplay between when, the, when heaven and earth, if you like, interact, there are amazing things happening. I believe that's what the miraculous is. When we see supernatural things happening, it's an interaction between heaven and 
the earth, between the, you know, the realm of heaven working within us into the realm of the natural. And of course it all eventually merges together. In Hebrews 3 verse 6, it says about Jesus Christ that but Christ was faithful as a son over his household. Whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm in him. You know that, that word, that holding fast, that, that same concept of holding fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. You know, are you confident in God? I met a couple yesterday in Cashman and they were telling me, um, we got to chat with them. I actually happened to be witnessing to this guy and then I was witness to this lady and then I found out the two men together, their husband and wife. But they were telling me that they had... Um, they were only recently married, I asked them the kids, said no, no. But like a big problem that's coming for a lot of people in this country, they were in rented accommodation and the person who wanted the accommodation asked them to leave because they needed the property for something. And so they were now having to move back in with his parents as a couple. And of course the scripture says you know when you get married you leave your mother and father. The man does and you cleave to your wife. It's a very unnatural thing to go back to your parents. It's actually a very difficult thing because parents, you know, it's not the natural order of things. But they have no way of doing, they have nothing else they can do. And I've heard numerous stories lately of people in similar situations. And I shared testimony with them how God had provided my home for me because of prayer. And I've been trying to get them to see something that basically you know, if you can trust God, I told him a story, and it's a true one, of a girl, I knew this girl very well, and uh, she had four kids, and uh, <coughs> the fathers of those kids were gone, and she was left homeless, and uh, she had, basically, she was with four kids, and you can imagine, being homeless is not like, she had no place to stay, and she cried out to God, and she told God, she said, God, if you get me a place to stay, I'll serve you. And a friend, the girl she knew, she was doing this kind of, we do call new ages, but this girl came and said someone had moved out in flat cross from where she was on the third floor, and it was vacant, and she got, and she moved in, and, and she, she, yeah, she began to serve God, she got to give her a wonderful gift of prophecy, and, you know, and she got married to a guy that was pretty, pretty sound, and, you know, they had a good relationship, and, you know, things picked up, because she was now depending on God. Um, I, I told that to them to try and encourage them, you know, to think about bringing God into the equation, you know, in situations in life. Because we don't know what we're going to face. We, we don't know what's coming down the line or what might even happen tomorrow. But if you're hanging on to God, I just have this picture in my head of, um, and you know, the rope. And, um, I, I saw this years ago on the TV. You remember those things, those big balloons, were like air buses they were called? And the, the American army were doing work with these, and all the soldiers were pulling one down. It's probably, I'd say there's probably 50 soldiers pulling this rope to pull down this air bus to this big thing, like, is it the Zeppelin? Is that what they're called in Germany? But they're pulling it down anyway. And as they're pulling it down, this gust of wind blew the thing. And the thing started taking off, and no matter how hard they pulled, they, they couldn't hold it. So you see, they were all dropping off like flies. You know, from the rope, it just it was, it was lifting them, like, they were starting to lift so they were dropping. And then, there were three guys on the rope, and they had not let go in time, if you know what I mean. If they let go now, they were, they were going to die, because, you know, the distance, you could probably let go at this height, but anything above that, you were going to break your legs, and above the height of the roof, well, you were a goner. And I was looking at it, and there was, there was one guy was hanging on the bottom like that, just the wind took and he was hanging on and eventually he couldn't, he just didn't have the strength and he fell to his death. And then the next side up the rope was further, he had his legs wrapped around it and what way ever he could, but he couldn't, he couldn't hold on and he fell to his death. And then the third lad held on and somehow he stayed, I don't know how he got up there, how he did it or whatever, but he didn't die. And the picture is really in a way, not that God like you know, but the picture is holding on like that to God. That's what it's about. Holding on like that to God, like that. You know, if I let go, 
of our God. And that's the dependency in God that actually the word mocks. Which is, which is strange. I, I remember when I started working near the mine where I live, and um, I had a little small red Bible, and it fell out of my bag in an office, and there was a, a lady there, she was, um, uh, she had a big job there, she was an environmental engineer or something, but well, she said, everybody needs a crutch. So I'm like, I never answered, but actually, um, if that's the way she wanted to interpret it, I'm glad I have a crutch, if you put it that way. I'm glad I realised I had no need for a saviour. I mean, sometimes coming to Christ is as much about affliction as it is about conviction of sin. There's a kind of a, an interplay between both, but um, I just wouldn't know what I know today. If I hadn't needed a crutch, a sheep, or something, whatever. But, you see, that's the attitude. It's a little sort of a, a little like that, oh, you, you can't or whatever. But it's, um, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. Actually, it's an arrogance. On some hands. Alright. Um, <clears throat> Revelation 19, verse 11, speaking of Jesus, then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war. He's, the rider is called Faithful and True, that is our Lord. Faithful and true. There's other scriptures, but you don't have to go to them. Revelation 3 14 and Revelation 1 5, all of this similar thing. The one thing about God, about sin, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says that Jesus is faithful, trustworthy, to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There seems to be a little bit of a, a kind of a um, a debate about sin, because the, the, the scripture says, blessed is the man who sinned, God doesn't hold against him, God doesn't impute against him. There's the, like, the carte blanche forgiveness that we get when we come to faith, everything we've done prior to that, is so God, it's gone from God's memory, completely. And then there's the ongoing issue of sin with a believer as he learns to walk in the spirit. And the word of God tells us that if we confess, we can him and Jesus to forgive. I think it's only just being right to be honest with the Lord, you know that, because sin has consequences in the natural as well. Um, in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 2, it speaks about Jesus. He was faithful to the one who appointed him. He was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. So Jesus was faithful and Moses was faithful. Because, because God gave them a trust. You know, when someone gives you a trust, like, if someone came along and said, actually, there's a guy I know, I mean, uh, he, he had to go to America, and he had six big boxes, and he gave them to a friend of his, and he trusted them to him, and he put them in the storage. But he had to move out, he got a phone call, or he got caught up, he had to move out and move into a new place. And he couldn't take the boxes because he had no space for them. And he asked me what to do, and I, I told him where to, where to send it, that they would be kept, so that he could. But the guy came back, and where are my boxes? He came back from America, and he's trying to explain it. He was really mad, and he didn't kind of understand what the guy was saying. But sometimes people might put a trust in you for something. Maybe it might be your know, possessions, it might be a responsibility they give you. Um, I don't know, I, I think I told you the story of Brenda's uh, niece. She, she was, she's a Christian, but when she was leaving Hong Kong, her best friend started crying and said, you know, how she was up the creeks and she lived and so on. And there was such good friends, she gave her her card, her, you know, link card to, to get some money. She had some money, you know. And um, this girl used her bank details not just to clean her out for two years of variance. Like she was going home to, to, to her fiance's funeral, he died at sea. She also used to help to take out a loan of 5000 And when this poor girl came back, they took her passport from her and they wouldn't give it. 
until it was repaired and it was a major big deal, you know, Brenda had to really, you know, seek a lot, seek God a lot on that one. But this girl broke her trust, you know, the trust was there. You know, that's that's a real case of case of unfaithfulness. And an extreme case of it. There can be unfaithfulness in marriage. There can be unfaithfulness in friendship. There can be unfaithfulness in church. There can be unfaithfulness in, in, in lots of different ways. But it's not what God wants. God is looking for faithful servants, faithful people. I just go quickly to a few Proverbs here. Proverbs 11 verse 3 says, A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Because you know, sometimes if you're telling secrets and you're whispering words, you're stirring up and fermenting emotion. It might be negative towards the person you're talking about. The integrity of the upright will guide them, but the perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. Uh, Proverbs 13 verse 7, 17 says, A wicked mess messenger fallen into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is helped. It's actually helped in this case. A wicked messenger falls into trouble with a faithful ambassador brings help. An ambassador is someone who goes to represent someone. He brings a message. We all know what an ambassador is. Proverbs 14, verse 5. A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Don't you ever be in a situation where someone you know begins to lie about you in a public here and it's not. It's not something that uh, it's very pleasant. Proverbs 20 verse 6 says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. And what that's actually saying is that quality of being faithful is not very common in society. It's not common in all men. Now Proverbs 25 verse 13, As the cold of snow in the time of harvest so is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refreshes the soul of his masters. In the olden time, you know, people had to send messages, not through the post, but they had to send someone with the message, and it was a big thing to get a message from. Now we're in the age of the internet, you can have instant messages, even a thing called messengers, isn't there? That a lot of people are familiar with. Proverbs 26, 7, verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And of course, the standing example of that is Judas' kiss betraying Jesus with a kiss. And Proverbs 28, verse 20. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. You see the difference? You know, the quality of being faithful, God blesses it. Like, make no mistake about it, God blesses faithfulness. Not necessarily always with, like, lots of money or material things, but often with material things, and often, you know, with wealth. But more, more than anything, with spiritual blessing in your soul, peace, spiritual gifts, Revelation, truth, things that matter to the human soul. And it's a byproduct of being faithful to God. Um, Jesus, I, I won't get into this today because we don't have enough time, but just to, to kind of go over it. Jesus contrasted um, the difference between a faithful servant and an evil servant. In Luke chapter 12, 35 to 48, Get that one. Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 48. Uh, let your. Luke chapter 12, 35. Is that 35? Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. When he will return from the wedding, that when he comes, and of course the master is Jesus. And, and the wedding that took place well Jesus was caught by it, that when he comes and knocks that he that they may open to him immediately blessed are those servants whom the master and if he should come 
in the second watch or come in the third watch and find some so blessed are those servants. But know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak the parable only to us or to all the people? And the Lord said, who then is that faithful? Here's the question to ask yourself. Who is the faithful and wise steward? Whom his master, of course our master is Jesus, Jesus is Lord, Lord is the Lord the master, who will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season. Blessed is that servant, and we're his servants, whom his master, Jesus, will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make a ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, the master's the name is coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and at an hour when he's not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion to the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask for more. Of course, the whole, uh, the whole gist of that is, is summed up in that last sentence there. That God has actually placed the trust in us. When God has given us of his spirit, he has placed trust in us. You may be called, you know, to be, uh, you know, maybe a minister. You may be called in your workplace to shine the light. You may be called to be a counselor. You may be called to use spiritual gifts God has given you. But when God gives to you, he places a trust in you. And sometimes that's prayer. I believe there's people in this church that you're called to actually a ministry of intercession. I just feel there's something strong here in this church. You're called to a ministry of intercession. And that's something, because you don't get people to see that and give you a pat on the back when you achieve something, it's something maybe sometimes it's hard to keep going with. But I believe God wants me to encourage you this morning to keep going with. If you're called to be an intercessor and you receive, you know, the spirit of revelation, and you receive what God wants you to pray about, keep going with it. Keep praying with it because it's part of God's method of advancing his kingdom here on the earth. But the, the, the overriding message in that, in that uh, speaking of that faithful servant versus the, uh, the evil servant, is that God is looking for this quality in us. <clears throat> That whatever is entrusted to us, that we are faithful to follow through with. We live in a part of the world where people consider even church optional. I go for like, I don't like it. If you get offended or get in a bad mood or someone says something I don't like, I leave. I go somewhere else. Or I might not go anywhere else. Right? Someone showed me their church recently. A two people showed me this separately. This is my church. Before. This guy said, This is my pastor. I said, He just happens to live like 5,000 miles. This is not matter, it's my pastor. I text him, I email him, and this, that, the other. That's not church. You know, that's just not church. Church is an assembly of people coming together, each person having something to contribute so that everybody be part of the body of Christ. The whole body built itself up together with nothing. We're not independent. We can't be independent, even if we want to be. We are actually very, very much interdependent. But God is looking for faithfulness. And you know, the, the times it's difficult to be faithful is the times it cost you. Sometimes it costs you. You know, to stay faithful to church. I mean, do you make it your priority to do you make the church a priority in your mind at least? Or is it like I go there if I can, I go there if I 
you know, whatever. But you see, it's, it's, it's what's important to God. When you prioritize what's important to God. When you, in your heart at least, like, I mean, obviously circumstances and take things. But when you prioritize what God says is important to God, then you're putting God first. You get me? You're putting His desires first. You're putting His wishes first. You're putting His commands first. And to be faithful to God really demands a lot of discipline. It's, it's, it just really does. To be faithful to what He's called us to do. I don't even feel, like, to be straight and honest, I don't feel worthy to preach this sermon. But because of the word came up during the week, and I'm just looking into it and exploring it and preaching this sermon to myself. God has called us to something. Um, in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, I won't read God's just too much, but it says in verse 29, it says, For everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. There is the hint all the way through the scripture of loss in our lives when God dishes out the eternal rewards because of our unfaithfulness. This I don't believe that in, in, you know, it's a salvation issue, but it certainly is a strong indicate warning, if you like, in the scripture against unfaithfulness. Because anyone who's ever been hurt by unfaithfulness in a relationship kind of has some idea, you know, why God would consider this an important quality. And actually, you know, whatever God has called you to, other people are depending on your faithfulness. God's called you, for example, to deliverance ministry. What about a demon possessed person? You're going to stay demon possessed if you don't exercise your ministry. Or if you do it maybe in a half-hearted way or something. Um, maybe God's called you to you know, earn money and support certain things, ministries and so on. If you don't support those ministries, the ministries can't function. Especially mi missions and different things. There are lots of different aspects to it. You might be a lonely person. You might have a ministry of helps. But you don't want to use it. So that person's sitting there not benefiting from what God has given you to benefit them. It's about being unselfish, really, with whatever God has, has given us. Um, in Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 13, and this is the contrast between the, um, the shrewd servant um, who's faithful in right, unrighteous manner. I don't really go through it, but he says, there was, well, you won't. So. <laughs> no, it's just too long, I, I won't. But verse 10 says, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust, unjust in the least is unjust also in much. In other words, there's a quality. If God has given you, um, how would I put it? If God has given you, okay, not a lot, like in terms of spiritual gifted or. But whatever God is, see the point is, it's not about, because some people are very dynamic gifts and they, they, you know, they, some people have TV ministries and mega churches and all these things. But God has meant put a deposit in all of us. And what God is looking, it's very same as the, the widow, when she put in the might, the smallest unit of currency. And Jesus said, she's given more than everybody. Because she gave everything she had. That's it. It's, it's all like relative, you know. So God looks to really... Whatever God has called us to do, or whatever God has given us the way of the Spirit, how much have we used whatever God has given us for the benefit of others and for the advancement of the kingdom of God here and there? So that souls ultimately escape hell. We're part of this. God works through His, we're His hands and feet. He's the head of the household, we're the members of the household. Jesus runs his church truly. He runs the head of the church, but the Spirit is a minister, administrating within the hearts of the believers so that God's purposes and plans can be fulfilled. Um, in Luke 19, uh, verse 11 to 24, in verse 17 it says, Well done, good and 
faithful servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have then authority over ten cities. I can't, just because of time, I can't go into these parables, but here again, because someone is faithful in very little, God gives them this extraordinary, extraordinary reward. Because, you're, because this quality so much matters to God. So much matters to God that if He's given you just a small, how do I put it? If He's given you like a relatively small gift of faith, for example, but as you exercise that small gift of faith, as you exercise that, you are showing yourself faith. Because it's easy to dismiss spiritual things, it's easy to dismiss you know, certain things, but it's when you're faithful to what, because people depend on your faithfulness. Human beings are interdependent. If someone decides to pollute the oceans as they're getting polluted, everybody gets affected. We are interdependent creatures, trying to be independent creatures, because sometimes people, you know, can, can make life difficult to us. But I just believe, just, uh, I'm not going to use any more scriptures, uh, I have a lot written here, but I'm not going to use it because of time, but I really believe that God wants us to get a hold of this. He wants us to get a hold of this, that we are completely faithful to Him, that there's no one else gets first place, not even our spouse, that we are completely, completely faithful. God. Because we are in a society today which more and more and more as Christian values get eroded and secular humanistic values come in. Being a Christian and being a faithful Christian is not popular. It's considered, you know, maybe fringe or something, whatever. But that's when God calls us to take our stand. When the opposing forces come in any army, you know, if, if a man is a man, he's going to stand and face the opponents. I saw actually a video last night of the Roman Legion. I had no idea how big a Roman Legion was. And they did, for the, the film Spartacus, they did a reenactment of how a Roman Legion operates. There's about 4,800 soldiers in each legion. And the legions were split into like these sections here, they were split into sections. But it, they were, it was an extraordinary, for its time, an extraordinary method of warfare. Absolutely extraordinary method. And they had, they, they, they worked in such a way, but they, but they were shown like the gods, when the gods fought them, which were the Celts of France, that they, 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 when they, they had such, such discipline, and they were done in such an organized way, that when they advanced, you know, it was slow, but it was deliberate. It was like a juggernaut coming. And these other armies would come and see this very imposing war machine ahead of them. It was all hand to hand in those days. War machine coming, and it was very imposing. But of course, the real men, you know, they still took on the fight. And that's what we are called to do. We are called to take the fight to the enemy. Why do we have to come to God and say, you know, help me out with this, help me out with this problem, help me out? Why not go on the offensive? Why not go and rub the devil's camp? Why not go and pluck someone out of the darkness and cause the devil to shake? Because you're seated with Christ in heavenly places and you've been given authority over the power of the evil one. Why not go and advance the kingdom of God? Why not go on the offensive? Because, you know, very often what happens is when we don't, we go backwards. And then we end up having to get fixed all the time. But when you decide, no, God, no, this is too big a deal to treat lightly. We are the saints of God. We are set apart by God for a holy purpose. And this is an end-time generation. The devil is still the same yet as he always was. His tricks are just a bit more white. But I believe that God is calling us, calling us to hear what the Spirit is saying now. It is time 
to take action. If you are a child of God here this morning, and if you have been dormant for a long, long time, just hear what I'm saying to you this morning. It is time to take action. It is time to take action. It's not tomorrow, it's not yesterday, today is the day, and it is time to take action. You have to stand up, you have to be counted, you have to be girded up with the weapons of war. Because we are, in this generation, about to enter in the greatest battle in history. The battle where Lucifer's last night against Christ, and you, you read about it there, is about to take place. An apocalyptic judgment to come upon this earth, and God's wrath to be poured out in full measure. And you know something like, there are no cowards in heaven. God has called us. I know we have limitations, we feel weak, we don't feel adequate or whatever. But we have a mighty God. We have a glorious God. We have God. The scripture said, if God is for you, who can be against you? And if you want this morning to make a note of allegiance to God afresh, I know most of us here are believers, but if you want this morning to say to God, that you want to step up to the mark. That you want to be a faithful servant of God. That you want to go wherever he sends you. Do whatever he asks you. And not shrink back. If you want that, just stand on your feet this morning. If that is you. If that is your heart's desire. To take the battle to the enemy. And use the resource that God has given you. To the best of your ability. To accomplish God's will for your life and stand up. Stand up at this time. Mm -hmm. Father, you know the hearts of each person in this congregation this morning, Father. You have taken us all, Father, from the ashes of God and you have raised us up. Father, as your servants arise this morning, I pray this morning, Father God, for a newfound boldness in their lives, Almighty God to serve you. I ask God, my Father, that you would move by your mighty hand this morning upon this congregation. We are small, God, and we are weak, but you are strong, and you are great. And so, Father, I ask that you would move upon us as a people, and everyone who stood to their feet this morning, that you would move upon them, and that you would cause fate to arise in their hearts for exploits, your word says in the last days, Lord God, when evil arises, Lord God, that your sins will do exploits. And I pray, God, that you will cause faith to arise in the hearts of your people for exploits. And I pray, Almighty God, there might be a rumbling, there might be a rumbling, Almighty God, that your servants might hear the, the carrying cry of heaven this morning. And Lord, as they go from this house this week, Lord God, that they might be, Lord God, more emboldened than before. <coughs> More filled with faith than before. More committed to you than before. And Lord, seeing, Almighty God, the glorious inheritance that's in you and them, Father God. Lord, I just pray for your saints right now. I ask God you would bless them and protect them. I pray that you would open their eyes to see the wiles of the evil one, Father God. That they might be able to rout the enemy in their own lives, Almighty God. I pray, God, that you would give wisdom, Father God, into the hearts of your people, Almighty God. But I pray, God, that this would be, Lord Jesus, that the, Lord, that the spirit that's upon your people, Father God, would be a warrior spirit, Almighty God. Lord, that would take offensive action, Father God, against the, Lord, the plans and the snares of the evil one, Father God. I pray that prayer, Almighty God, would be, Lord Jesus, like fire in the, in the bosoms of your people, Almighty God. And that faith might explode, O oh God, in the midst of this house, Father God, in the midst of this place, Lord, that we might see you as God, yes. and that we might see you, Father God, as your servants, Almighty God, and as soldiers and foot soldiers in the kingdom of God. I pray, God, that you would cause us to see that you are riding the heavens, Lord, yes. that you are riding the heavens, O oh God, and that you are crowned, O oh God, in righteousness, O oh God, and that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I pray, God, that you would cause your servants, your people, Father God, to view themselves, Almighty God, as your servants, Father God, in a purpose of heaven that you have for the earth at this time, Father God, and that they would not slide into the